we are meant to be self-reliant. We are meant to be only reliant on the self, that which is ultimately true of us, that which has existed before this whole story that we have about ourselves came into being, will exist long after it's gone. We need to be self-reliant. And so this is a perfect opportunity to go within and to find that source of truth that all of our spiritual greats, all of our spiritual heroes, all of our, all those individuals inspire us that they knew, that they knew, that they appreciated, that they understood. So it's in a sense, it's challenging us to actually do what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I gave a talk yesterday for a unity church. It was actually the unity church that I gave my ever first talk on any kind of spiritual matter at um, back in 2005. But they uh, they needed me to, to fill in for their minister. So I did it via Zoom, um, which was interesting. Um, but in that discussion um, that I was having with them, again, it, it brought home this idea that spiritually speaking, there are things that we are meant to do. And we have to do them. We approach the spiritual life for many different reasons. And this is discussed in the, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, in the chapter where it talks about people come to God for different reasons. Some want this, some want to connect with their ancestors. But the, the very, very, very few want to know God or a divine consciousness as it is. If I recall correctly, I think the statement was one in, one in a thousand want to actually know God as God is. And of those thousands, only one in a thousand of those does the work to come to it. But we're at the end of year two. And believe me, I understand that after two years of practice, that doesn't mean that there's any grand expectations that you've figured it all out yet. But at the end of two years of practice, there is the expectation that either you know what you need to do or uh, you have the materials available to you to understand what is required of you. And you are able to go back to the materials and be, in a sense, um, re-inspired or you are able to pick up the Gita again and reread it and recognize um, either aspects of the process that you missed. It doesn't mean that you have that you specifically missed them. It could be that you weren't just you weren't necessarily ready for them um, yet. And so we're going to find that our work in the yoga tradition just keeps going. And you have to be able to be all right with that. I was having a discussion with one of the Kriya Yoga uh, apprenticeship students about this idea of change and how based on the difficulties of life, we often want to reach a point where we just feel like, okay, we've got it. Nothing's going to change. I've got enough money in my bank account, don't got to worry about it. I've got a good relationship, a good family, don't need to worry about them. Um, I have a relationship with uh, a spiritual mentor, good. We start latching on to all these things, trying to set them up as though, as long as they are there within our experience, we don't have to worry about anything. But that is not the nature of the world. The world is going to change. It may be that you're lucky enough that for the duration of your life, you either have worked hard to have plenty of resources for yourself, or you're lucky enough to have been gifted resources from your ancestors or other boosts of luck. It may be that you are lucky enough to have a relationship with one person and you both make it into your 80s and 90s and, and pass within a few years of each other. That may be the case, but 
it is not likely for many people. It may be that you find a spiritual teacher and that um, that teacher will be there with you for the duration of your life in physical form to be able to bounce ideas off of, to help you grow, to see your blind spots that you can um, fill it in. That's more likely true if your teacher is younger than you. Uh, for example, Mr. Davis, uh, he began traveling and lecturing um, in his 20s, if I recall correctly, maybe it's early 30s, but I believe it was his 20s, late 20s. And so he had met many students who were older than him. And um, so he was there for the duration of his life. But in my situation, I was much younger than him. So that means that as far as a physical body goes, he's not there physically. So if we can come to this understanding of the, the changeableness and transience of the world, uh, we can start to shift our perspective away from trying to make something here last forever to embracing the change, to while you are here in this physical world, embracing that change. If the reality of this physical world is change, then what's the problem with loving it, with embracing it, with changing your, your point of view from, I have to latch on to something that will be here forever to, I love change. I embrace the change. I embrace the growth. It carries me forward. I always use the example of um, a surfer, which is odd because I've never really surfed. Um, but think about a surfer who, who's riding waves. Um, they're waiting for that next wave to carry them in. They're not just sitting out there on a raft enjoying the calm waters. That's fine too. But they are, they're, they're sitting there and they're peaceful and present, ideally, at least ones I've known who've been this way, in the ocean. But then when a wave comes, they don't say, oh, geez, I got to get up and, and, and surf again. They say, no, this is good. This is a whole new wave. I'm going to ride it in. I'm going to ride it in the best way I know how. So I'm telling you all these things because uh, much of what we're experiencing in the world, which is common since time began, uh, things will rise, things will fall, things will change. Sometimes you'll get along well with family members and friends. And sometimes your children will love you and sometimes they'll hate you. Sometimes you'll, you'll understand what your spouse is up to and other times you'll be confused out of your mind. Um, sometimes you will know and feel that work and the work that you're doing is purposeful and meaningful and flowing well. Other times you'll get up and wonder why you're even doing what you're doing. But None of that from the yogic perspective is ultimately, it doesn't ultimately matter. What ultimately matters is embracing that, loving it, appreciating it, knowing that that is just how things go. That is, that would be the ultimate correct expectation of the world is that it's going to change. And once you make peace with that, things calm down in here. Things calm down in your brain and your nervous system because it is the expectation or the desire or the want or the craving for stability in this world that makes us all nuts up here, that, that, that prevents us from meditating in a yogic fashion. It prevents us from meditating in a true yogic fashion. Because once you make peace with the changeableness of things, there's no surprise. You're not going to get bent out of shape. So now you know that, oh, it's changeable. So of course it's easy to pull your awareness within, to direct your attention inward, inside, and to say, yeah, all this stimulation, all these thoughts, all these memories, all these changeable things I think are so important, they're gonna go away eventually. It doesn't mean you push them away. You don't have to actively say, I, I quit everything. <laughs> Believe me, they're gonna go away on their own. But it does mean that when you sit to meditate, that now you can easily just admit the nature of the world and be okay turning your awareness within. Because one of the things, at least from what I've noticed, uh, that prevents us from turning our awareness within is the worry or the anxiety or the thought that if we let go of all of this stuff, it is going to go away. Meaning we're going to lose the, that which we are attached to. Well, if you don't need it, it'd be great if you lost it. But I can assure you that 
by internally saying this doesn't really matter right now and letting go of those things, um, it will be all right. And you will find that it is easier for you to meditate. And sometimes, I don't know if this is true for you, but I know it's true for many, um, since the rest of the world are filled with worry, worriers or people who are attached to everything, you don't want to let go of stuff because that's going to make you different. You're, you, you might have the fear that you're not going to be able to relate to others anymore and you lose your friends or you lose family members. Well, you can still have friends and family members and still not relate <laughs> to them in regards to the things that they think. Believe me, I have plenty of uh, friends and family that think all kinds of crazy stuff and it doesn't hurt our relationship at all. Let them think what they want to think. Be kind and loving. So whether or not you can relate to people through attachments and worry, uh, I guarantee that um, if you don't let that be a, a motivating force for you, you'll find that you still can be friends with people, even though you don't understand their worries or you don't understand their anxieties or you, you can't get behind the things which cause them to uh, break down and give into cravings and those types of things. We really have to, at this point in time, uh, after going through two years of training, start to take a look at how are we living our lives? Are we actually doing, are we actually doing, or at least trying to do, uh, what we've been reading about, what we've been taught? And if not, how can we motivate ourselves? How can you be motivated to start trying to do that until you have the experience? This is a lifelong process. So it all boils down to beginning to really let go of those things, at least just during meditation, that you think are so important. And I mean fundamental things, fundamental things. That can go as deep as uh, the, the love of your, your, your family. That can go as deep as the duty you feel you have to society. Um, that can go as deep to um, how you feel like you always need to be taking care of your body. Yes, you do need to be taking care of your body. But during meditation, whether you have an ache or a pain or you feel wonderful, it doesn't matter. You let it go for the duration of meditation. You turn your awareness within. You begin to recognize how and what exists when you're no longer uh, engaged in those kinds of things. <laughs>